It's time. Episode 12023. Apologize to me. He's back. Happy New Year, Watto. How you doing, bro? Happy New Year to you, Marty. I missed that little introduction. Boy, you've got a sexy voice. Go you should be on. doing love songs to midnight with Marty. Well, I would be. However, I'd just be cancelled like Ian Smith was by Sky. And we're going to talk about this because he was cancelled by Sky. We all know that. Uh, Dave Rennie, uh, why didn't NZR do this when they had the chance? Let's talk about that. The demise of Spark Sport, which, Mark, we've been talking about for the last four or five months. It was inevitable. How, however, I do think that it's probably... It's probably leaving us sports fans a little worse off. Last weekend of the Sevens in New Zealand, this coming weekend, how to kill the golden goose laying the golden egg. And Liverpool. Apologise to me! Hey, but let's start with Dave Rennie, because that's the story du jour. Did you see this coming, mate? No, look, I didn't. Um, 38% winning record, but look, I'm not sure that you've got the cattle in Australia, have you? I mean, you know, you can't turn donkeys into thoroughbreds. Now, Dave Rennie's biggest mistake was that he never had continuity in selection, and he didn't seem to have ever settled on a halfback, first five type combination, midfield combination. But you could argue that Dave Rennie was also trying to build some depth within Australian rugby, which they just haven't had. And there's also been some criticism that he was a bit too close to the players and perhaps things were a little bit too nice. Also concerns over uh, the number of injuries and the constant injuries within the team and maybe some of the training regimes weren't quite the right ones. Um, but I, look, I, I think when you go back and you look at the you look at the likes of Phil Kearns um, and some of those sort of rugby commentators, I, I, look, they just don't want a foreigner coaching the Wallabies. They never have... It's always been a little bit of niggle. You always sense that the knives have already been out and they're already in the back of Dave Rennie. Um, but look, oh, you know, is, is Eddie Jones the right guy? I think Eddie Jones might be the right guy in the short term for Australia, but he's not a guy in the long term. He's not that guy that's going to hang around three or four years. He's going to burn too many bridges. He's too intense. He's too tough. He's, he's a different personality. But as we've alluded to, Martin, I mean, so we've had Wales make changes we've had england make changes and now we've got australia which to me highlights the fact that the rest of the world don't see the world cup as a four-year cycle which new zealand tries to sell us in the name of rest and rotation in the name of justifying some poor results and so that just to me um i think reaffirms my attitude in my opinions that rugby the world cup it's not a four-year cycle let's not use that as an excuse and let's not that dictate other forms of rugby in the game so yes yeah, some interesting things have come out of it for me no i just think you're as, as weak as mate i think you're kind of soft on me i think the new year what have you eating too much cake and drinking too much lager and having too much fun have you i mean come on mate let's talk about dave rennie honestly here dave rennie's got a halo around his head as far as new zealand rugby fans are concerned for what he won a couple of titles with the chiefs he had a damn good team to do that i'm not saying he's a bad coach but these results in Australia perhaps are the truth. Maybe that's what we're actually seeing. Maybe that this guy that we all like and actually put on this pedestal isn't the actual coach that he is. I acknowledge everything that you've been saying. And I, you know, I'm sitting there looking at it going, God, I mean, he's only got probably 30 or 40 good players to actually choose from. Half of them have been injured. He was a, a brain a brain fade away from beating us in the first Bledisloe test. And good God knows what would have happened in Auckland if they'd actually won that game. He's a point away from France, a point away from Ireland. I mean, all of that you stack on one side of the plate and you think, I mean, this sounds like a harsh decision, but maybe, it's, maybe Mark, he's just not that good a coach. I mean, what say that? Yeah, look, I agree. And I, I probably failed to mention that in my previous answer, but those that are Dave Rennie fans and were Dave Rennie fans, as you've alluded to, have they perhaps changed their mind? Have they perhaps now seen the flaws? And and is there, would a similar thing happen if Scott Robertson was to take the All Black job? I mean, these are the questions. What do we really know? Is there a big difference between coaching at a super rugby level where you've got some pretty good resource versus coaching at an international level? Yeah. Look, I mean, look at Warren Gatlin. Warren Gatlin goes well in the Northern Hemisphere because it suits his style of coaching. He comes comes back and coaches the Chiefs in a super rugby can't environment, open, yeah. expensive running rugby, and he can't he can't get a win, can he? But look, yeah, I mean, Dave Rennie, as I say, if his, if his thing was about trying to build depth and trying to build competition for places, I think he's done that. His problem is that he clearly hasn't communicated that rationale to those people around him. And it's about getting the job done in the last 10 minutes, and that's where he has come up short. Uh, the Wallabies, I mean, look at the World Cup. They sit on the right side of the draw. 
They should get through to the semi-finals. They've really only probably got to get past Wales to do it. They will get through to the semi-finals. There's a good chance they could end up making the finals. We know the Rugby World Cup is a one-off situation. Uh, look, I think it's courage from Australian rugby. I think it was courage from the Welsh Rugby Union, courage from the English Rugby Union, and completely and utterly gutless from the New Zealand no, I Rugby I agree with that. In Absolutely. terms of not yeah. getting rid of Ian Foster. Look, yeah. We're not going to win the World Cup. We had a no, chance we're not going to win the World Cup. give ourselves a better chance of winning the World Cup all because of mateship, all because of being too close, and all just... Oh, come on, mate. I mean, acknowledge, acknowledge the truth the first and foremost, but we're not going to win the World Cup, Mark, because we don't have the playing strength, and that's the truth of it. The All Blacks... Look, you go. I go back to 2003 when England were the favourites. Other than that, every other single World Cup being played, the All Blacks go in as favourites. We've dominated the in-between years. That was always the joke. We're the best team in between World Cups. Well, this time we haven't been since 2019, mate. We haven't been able to consistently string two good performances together. You can blame me and foster as much as you like and you'll continue to do it because that's easy. I'm looking at the players and say, take some goddamn responsibility. Look at the last 10 minutes against okay. England last year. Mate, and we, we bottled it. These players, we 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 lack world-class strength at the moment, which is why yeah. when I no, say, listen to me, when I say, well, we're not going to win the World Cup, I also say that we've got as good a chance as anyone of winning it because, as you say, it's a one-off performance to beat that team. It's whether you can string those three performances together in a row. Yeah, OK, but you've just come out and basically said Australia's problems come back to Dave Rennie, possibly. But OK, what about the Australian rugby players taking some responsibility here? Well, they're not good I enough. agree, but part of the reason we don't have rugby players here is because the way the game's been run, the way the game was monopolised. And I'll keep going back to it. Steve Hansen and these guys and Steve Chu have a lot to answer for if there is, in fact, a lack of depth currently in New Zealand rugby. I don't. I think there is depth here. I think some of the players we've got are good, but I think there needs to be a different voice. I think there needs to be a different way of doing things. I mean, look at your Manchester United football team in all seriousness. They get rid of Cristiano Ronaldo. They change the coach. Suddenly, things are starting to look good for United. They could end up, ultimately end up winning the English Premier League. Oh, Who I would have thought that? that? Come on, and so you still got the same group of players, but suddenly you brought in a different environment, a different voice and things, and got rid of a couple of bad eggs. You, you can sit back. I, I find it really, really hard to believe, Martin, and this is what you're telling me, that no one wanted Ian Foster as a coach. No one really rated him as a coach. And then poor old Ian, just by coincidence, happens to get the worst group, playing group, and depth of playing talent available in the history of New Zealand rugby. Just how unlucky for Ian Foster, the coach nobody wanted, nobody rates, and just on top of that, boy, coincidence. Okay, well, I'm going to shoot your argument down. Here, here we go. Yeah. I've loaded the shot. Here we go. Uh, this is this is this is the this is the anti-argument to that. Sir Alex Ferguson won the title in 2012, 2013, and left on an absolute high. But he had wrung the last out of that squad. That squad, there was nothing left. The best players were way past their best. Uh, we had Robin Van Persie got injured the next year. In comes Moyes. Moyes was a good coach. Don't don't forget that he got Everton to the Champions League. And what happens? He inherits a bunch of players who are quite average, who are past their best. We've lost some of our best players, and all of a sudden, it's his fault that you. United are rubbish for the next two or three years and he gets sacked. Maybe that's where Ian Foster is. Ian Foster isn't a bad coach, but maybe what he inherited, what he got from Hanson after the 2019 Rugby World Cup, maybe it's that situation. Oh, but that happens after every World Cup. And we, as you've said, after every World Cup, we lose a group of players. And as you've said, up until right now, we've actually been the best in between World Cups. And then what? Suddenly it changes. We lose a group, but only this time it's at a more severe level. And Ian Foster, maybe just Ian Foster's not that good. Maybe his selections aren't that good. You know, how do you put guys like Angus Ta'aval? How do you take players like that and make them all blacks? Everybody sitting at their lounge knows that these guys are absolutely no good whatsoever. Useless, unfit, terrible ball-carrying players. You know, you let guys like Boschier head off overseas. You get guys like James Logo who perform every week. And you just sit there and you go... Hang on a minute, mate. Don't tell us we don't have any depth. We've got the depth, but you just see it through your own little eyes. You just threw it through your own chief's bias or whatever you want to call it. Apologise to me! All right, let's move on then. Dave Rennie has gone. Eddie Jones is in. Spark Sport has gone. Sky Sport now have the goddamn monopoly that we always hated. Look, Spark Sport have been a joke. It has been an abject failure, costing hundreds of millions of dollars. And of course, they'll never admit that their promotional pieces are puff pieces, chest puffing pieces where they say, oh, we've done so well and we congratulate ourselves and everything else. Look, I mean, they have failed miserably. We all know that. However... I do think for us sports fans that going back to a monopoly with Sky is the last thing that we ever wanted, ever needed. And so how do we get into this position and how did Spark stuff this up? Well, Spark firstly paid way too much for the cricket, right? So I remember talking to um, 
I think it was John Flett, former head of Sky, and he said, look, we've, you know, when his time at Sky, you get people wanting to come in and challenge for these rights. And he said, look, they would have been having a big party. They won the rights off Sky. Then you wake up the next morning and you go, how do we pay for it? And that is the biggest problem. As you know and I know, the biggest problem in this country, Martin, is scale. We just simply don't have the population. And then you've got the production costs. The big things here which drive it are um, local sport, and therefore you have to produce it locally. And unless you've got a large subscribership, those costs are exorbitant. I mean, a game to broadcast or produce a live game of rugby is about $50,000. So you can imagine every single cricket game that they've had to then go and put an outside broadcast unit into, commentators, production units, and, you know, hey, we've got a commitment. We've got to bring you women's cricket. No one's watching it, but we've got a commitment to doing it. Well, let's take more money out of the bank. And I just think they came in and New Zealanders just weren't prepared to pay for two subscriptions yeah, and you had yeah, to choose yeah, one or the other yeah. but I also think an older generation just still aren't prepared are they to go onto a laptop to do things online digitally they just want to sit there in front of their tv hit a button and know it's going that's to come sky's on audience though mark and this is we've talked about and this is what frustrates me so goddamn much that is sky's audience sky who well, got rid of ian smith now and we all know why it's the diversity thing and it's the wokeness he's an old white man and that's why they've got rid of him but their subscriber base you morons is old white men men over 40 years old that's who subscribes to sky getting it for sport why don't they actually realize this yeah, no, but look, just quickly going back, I mean, we need, every industry needs competition, doesn't it? Yeah. It forces you to sharpen the pencil. It's good for the consumer. It creates efficiency. I mean, Sky is a train wreck. They've been arrogant for too long. Yep. They got themselves yep. into that position. I mean, still look at their share price. It is 22 cents. So it's actually $2.20 $2. on the share market at the moment. But what people don't realize is you actually get 10 shares for that. They've sort of, um, they do it to sort of almost create the perception that there's yeah, greater right. value in the company but you're actually getting 10 shares and you just sit there and you go oh, I'm with you on the Ian Smith thing and I thought it was really gutsy of Smithy to come out and talk about and subtly basically say look you know that the yeah, I got kicked out of wokeness. We've got to make sure we've got our quota of um, Pacific and Māori and women and all the rest of it in it. Meanwhile, I'm sitting there going, well, that's great. But how does that equate to providing a return back on investment for those shareholders? Because I remember having a meeting, Martin, I think I've already told this once previously in a podcast, but I had a meeting, had a really good television concept. I thought, look, I think I can do something for Sky. It was in the opinion space. I did a lot of work on the prop. I ran it past some big heads of industry and I went in there and I said, look, what I'm actually proposing is a really successful model around the world. And I gave a whole lot of ideas and I sort of showed what ESPN do with a similar model and how highly it rates. And I talked about opinion being very much the currency of a lot of television and mainstream sports platforms. And I actually said, look, even look at Mike Hosking in this country, whether you like Mike Hosking or not, the guy rates yeah, because he has yeah, an opinion. I right. mentioned Chris Ratu from the New Zealand Herald. You don't need to like Chris. But, hey, he gets a high level of engagement. And, you know, when I mentioned those, when I mentioned Hosking, the reaction I got from this meeting, and I was absolutely gobsmacked, they turned around to me and said, oh, Mark, are you just trying to target half a million white middle class men? And I was just like, Well, why sorry. wouldn't you? Well, sorry. I'm sorry. Isn't yeah, that an I'm audience? Sorry. Isn't that a valid audience? Isn't that an audience with oh, money to spend? Isn't that, isn't that Sky your audience, you morons? Yes, it is. But. But, but exactly, 90% of your audience is that demographic that you just described with a level of racism, with almost a level of disgust. It's like, well, we don't want to target those people. No. Come on, those people, those people are privileged. And it was almost that attitude. I'm like, well, hang on a minute. And I was so taken back by it that I, I sort of sat back and the following a couple of days later, I sent them an email saying, look, I didn't appreciate the comment. Firstly, I found it racist. Anytime you take a group of people and just, you know, put them into sort of one large group and, you know, what I call identity politics. And I said, well, hang on a minute. There's still the majority of your Sky subscribers. They're the majority of your Sky shareholders. And they're also the reason why about $17 million a year is spent on advertising with Mike Hosking. And I'm going, hang on a minute. So you'd rather just be woke. You'd rather just go out here and tick every box, but forget the shareholder. Forget the shareholder. Forget my mum who bought shares when the shares were $2 and hung on to them and they're now 22 cents waiting for somehow this thing to turn itself around. I mean, you know and I know. I mean, Ian Smith is one of the best commentators oh, glorious, we've ever had. Glorious. Brilliant. Go brilliant. back to the last I mean, one-day World Cup final. That is one of the most outstanding pieces of sporting commentary that last over the last 45 minutes that he did of any commentator commentating any sport ever in the world. The guy is but, world class. And not only that, he adds value to the 
actual presentation. And I can't accuse any other presenters at the moment of adding the same kind of value he does. No. Look, I look at Sky Sport and I look at look at the presentation panels. The programs are all dry and dull and boring and the same. And just because you played sport doesn't mean you can talk about it in a way that is going to get yeah. engagement from an audience. You're not a broadcaster. They don't train these people. I'm embarrassed for most of these people that are on Sky, Mark, to be honest. I sit there and I cringe. Honestly, I, 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 you know, I yell at the TV and I say, I could put you in front of a microphone in the, ra- on, in the radio. You'd be just as bad. None of you are any good at this. Why the hell have you got a job doing it? Because it's a box ticking exercise. It is. Virtue exactly, signaling. mate. And yeah. what it actually is, but you know, you get h- half these people, they sound like street kids, a lot of them, barely can string three sentences together. Then you come into the, the middle of an all black game. They come back to a panel. There's about three women on the panel. They've apparently all played international rugby, which means what? They might've still only played 20 games in their life. Let's not kid ourselves. The talent pool's not there. The depth is not there. Trying to tell some guy at home who's played a hundred club rugby games has watched every all black test since the age of six. And all it is, cliched lines that they've clearly written down and I can I can wrap them out oh yeah they've just got to get to the breakdown quicker got to get numbers to the breakdown our line speed is oh, just not good enough I know, I know, and it's just oh, these yeah. cliched yeah, lines that they've yeah. clearly heard from Justin Marshall or somebody written them down and that's all you get and it's the same stuff and like you Martin I just sit there and I just cringe in fact I just switch off I can't, I can't be bothered. Yeah. Now, no, I don't same. care. I don't care if, seriously, your entire panel is Māori, if your entire panel is women, as long as they're good broadcasters and they're going to tell me something I don't know and they're going to keep my level of engagement up. But it is just appalling because, hey, Martin, you're 50, you're white, you're a male, I'm the same. And it's just getting so, so hard now to go out there and get gigs. Like, I think in my sports, I'm a good sports commentator. But, you know, we are just scrapping for everything. And you just switch on. And they never, ever release their numbers. No. Because they know their numbers embarrassing. are crap. It's embarrassing. They know their it's numbers the same are as crap. Spark. And my, and, but, and you my know, mum's going, well, hang on a minute. If their numbers are crap, then clearly they can't be charging the advertisers that much because the advertisers are only going to pay based on their actual viewership. So how am I going to get my return on my shares, on my investment, if the revenue's not coming in? No, and all, all, all of this, ladies and gentlemen, if you, if, you, if you take the time, if you breathe and you listen to this, is absolute goddamn truth and, and sense. However, Sky, you know, uh, they, they are run by a woman who, I mean, and, and, and this says everything to me. You look at their emails and their pronouns are on their emails. I don't have to say anymore, okay? I mean, when you actually think that that is important and so important that you have to do that, that to me means that you have completely lost the plot. It's actually about providing a service to your customers. It's looking after the people that are actually subscribing to you on a monthly basis. It's providing programs that are of interest to that. But no, they get rid of Ian Smith. He will reappear. Don't worry about him, mate. I mean, he's such a good broadcaster. He will be back. Well, well the, the Australians appreciate talent, don't they? But but it comes back to this thing. And I've said this before, you know. So you've gone and spent almost $500 million on rugby over the five-year period, which is a hell of a lot of money. That is your marquee product. You believe by that investment that your business sinks or swims on rugby. So you would have thought, hey, you're responsible then for leveraging that product. So what's the best way of leveraging it? Well, getting people engaged, getting people discussing the game, getting bums on seats, saying, hey, MPC is important. Super Rugby is important. As long as we've got those, people will always want to be our customers. Well, people are going, well, hang on a minute, MPC, eh, I don't know if I want to pay any more. Don't, really, I'm only I'm only really paying now money to watch the All Blacks. Yeah, that's all we are. The all Black, the, and the All Blacks are really only interested now in winning the Rugby World Cup. And part of the problem is, and we've said this before, because every single one of their rugby shows is just a PR, it's just a PR story for New Zealand rugby. They never discuss the issues. They never go after Mark Robertson. They never actually have any highly engaging shows which challenge and establish have people around the water cooler talking about it the next day and therefore having it at the forefront of their minds. Go back to the days of Laurie Maines and John Hart. Go back to the days of, you know, uh, John Hart and and Blackadder and the Cantabrians and Carlos Spencer giving the Crusaders the fingers. Like it or not, high level of engagement, bums on seats, rugby was never more popular. Sky, oh, we can't have that model. We can't upset them. And like honestly believing that by being a PR firm, that somehow they're going to retain rugby forever, even though Amazon might come in yeah, four that's or five exactly, years mate, time exactly. and offer them $50 yeah. million and, and, more and rugby will go with rugby, them. Rugby, no you know it. Absolutely, you know that. Apologise to me! 
final topic then, well, two to go. Uh, last weekend of the sevens, and you know, and this this to me says everything about where New Zealand is at as a country and where, where New Zealand rugby is at as well. The golden goose laying the golden egg. You've absolutely killed it. You've absolutely cooked it. Mark, there is a darts franchise that goes around the world. They have dancing girls. They have singing. They have costumes. They have beer drinking. They make it rowdy. They make it a party. They get crowds. Tens of thousands of people all over the world go to that. It works. That used to be the sevens, but they've completely and utterly cocked it is what they have. Yeah, look, Martin, I'm sick and tired of these event organisers, and I've put State of Origin in there, trying to make out that mankind is perfect, and therefore we need to show perfection. We need to be goody-goodies. We're not. Man is flawed. People like to drink. People like to party. People like to have a good time. And when event directors actually wake up and realise, actually, to get promotion, to get people engaged, is actually go the other way. Allow them to be flawed. Allow them to have some fun. Yes, certainly, by all means, have, have a line that if you cross it, hey, there are going to be some serious ramifications for it. But the same people that complained about the drinking at the sevens because they saw one or two people urinating in the street after it, shut it down. Did they go when the alcohol left? No, they didn't. They just moved on to the next thing to shut that down. And so what we do, no different to what Sky and the conversation we've had, all we do these days, the whole country is set up to tailor for the 5% of the extreme left-wing nut jobs in this country, biggest winners who, would, who, lo- who, who, yeah. who love who love who love to tell everybody what to do, who always want us to study religion as long as it's their religion, who all want to bring in anti-hate speech laws, but they're the ones that determine what hate speech is. You know, look, State of Origin was a better product with the biff in it. You know, all of this stuff. Rightly or wrong, people love flaws. People love to just go and have a good time. The biggest, hottest ticket in town was the Wellington Sevens. Maybe they had it right, and yet, oh, no, we can't do that. Let's bring in some more marketing expert and some more consultants. There's got to be a better way. No, there's not. You had the formula right, and you went and screwed it. Finally, and I'm asking every single person this, mate. I'm going to revisit these comments. So, two questions. Are the All Blacks going to win the World Cup? And if not, who is going to win the Rugby World Cup? All Blacks won't win the World Cup, France will. 